homeless drunk woke up once in the street gutter one Sunday morning. His hair was a greasy mess. His ragged clothes were filthy and stained. He couldn't remember the last time he had a bath. He stunk terribly. But in a lucid and sober frame of mind, he decided he was tired of living like this. And about that time, he heard the bells of the First Baptist Church ringing from just down the street. So he decided he would go to church and turn his life around. He walked to the church. He climbed up the marble steps. And he stepped into the foyer. He was met by an usher wearing a meticulous three-piece suit who rushed up to the homeless bum, looked down the end of his nose and said, how dare you walk into this church dressed like that? I suggest you go back home and ask God what's appropriate to wear in his church. Man just looked at the usher and without saying a word, he turned around and left. On the next Sunday, after another week of, of, of drinking and living in the street, he woke up again and he felt more determined than ever that he needed to be in church, so he went again. Climbed the same steps, he walked into the same foyer, and the same usher came and met him and said, I thought I told you to ask God what was appropriate to wear in his church. The bum looked at him and said, I did. And God said, I don't have any idea. I've never been to that church. <laughs> In last week's message, we began to talk about how, how, how we can get a good idea of what God expects us to, how, how, he, how he expects us to treat other people. Today... We're going to get a more complete picture of how a Christian who is growing in Christ's likeness should relate to all kinds of people, but especially to people who are different from us. Today's discussion is a sin that was frequently committed in the early church. And that's not too hard to imagine because this sin has been committed, committed almost every day since, both inside and outside of the church. The Bible calls this sin personal favoritism. Today we call it by other names such as racism, classism, culturism, or sexism, or any other ism you can think of. Uh, racism, as you know, is prejudice against one whose skin color is different than yours. Classism is prejudice against someone whose economic status doesn't match your own. Culturalism is prejudice against somebody whose way of life or manner of dress or personal preferences are different than yours. And of course, sexism is prejudice against someone of the opposite sex. The fact that people are different is not the problem. The problem occurs when I decide I'm going to treat people based on the color of their skin or their economic status or their accent or any other thing. But before considering what the scripture has to say about partiality, think for a moment about the way Jesus, how Jesus treated the people he met. His ministry gives us a standard that we need to strive for in our journey to material, uh, to spiritual maturity. When we look at how Jesus dealt with other people he encountered during his time on earth, one fact jumps out rather starkly. Jesus did not relate to people based on how they spoke or how they, what they looked like or how much money they had. On the contrary, Jesus turned the world's standards on its head by the way he treated the poor and the social outcasts of the world. Think for a moment about the poor widow's offering or the woman at the well or the lepers or even the hated tax collectors. And who would have ever thought that a redeemed prostitute would be remembered for washing the feet of Jesus with her tears? Jesus was more concerned about the individuals he ministered to than he ever was about the opinion of the onlookers. He related to people based on what they could become on the inside, not what they were on the outside. And that's exactly why Jesus was called the friend of sinners. He related to everyone without ever compromising his holiness or sharing in their sin. 
So how are we relating to other people? We need to see them just exactly the way Jesus sees them. We need to also get a proper view of Jesus, as well as a proper view of ourselves in light of who Jesus is. So our text this morning, James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, if you're not already there, turn there, reveals three aspects of partiality that we must focus on in order to avoid it and to see partiality for what it really is. So let's take a few moments to talk about the problem and what you and I can do about it. The first aspect of partiality that I want you to see is that partiality is a sin. The Bible does not mince any words, nor does it camouflage its message. In fact, it places the cookies on the very bottom shelf so everybody can see them and reach them. Scripture plainly says in verse 1, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down by my footstool, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? There it is. Plain and simple. Faith in Jesus Christ and prejudice against others are incompatible. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you? Have you come to the correct conclusion that He is your personal Savior? Have you put your faith in Him alone for salvation? The answer is either yes or no. There is no middle ground. There are no other options. But if the answer is yes, then prejudice and favoritism can have no place in your life. But they did creep into the first century church, and they still exist amongst believers today. Look how, how James described it. Two visitors show up at church one Sunday. The first guy looks like he just stepped out of the pages of GQ magazine. He has a tailored shirt. He has French cuffs. Has his fine rings on his fingers, gold Rolex on his rich he's, he's, He looks good. Looks like me. All right, that's a stretch. But at any rate, he looks like a man of great influence and wealth. It's obviously that he's been somewhere and he's done something. He has made a mark. And it is clear as soon as this man walks into the room that he deserves attention. But at the same time, another man steps into the church from right off the street. It's obvious from the way he's dressed, he doesn't have a lot going for himself materially. His clothes are ragged and filthy. He smells horribly. His hair is matted and greasy. He isn't trying to be dirty, but after all, he is living in the streets. The very best that he has is shabby and tattered. One church, two visitors, Two extremes. There's nothing wrong with any of that. The problem is what happens next. Because the ushers now get into the act. Guess who got the preferential treatment? The man who looks rich got a good seat. The poor man's told to go stand in the back of the room. But notice this, this very much overlooked fact. Who made the value judgment here? It wasn't the rich man. The Bible does not condemn successful people because they're successful. Nor does it, is God saying that a person has to apologize for being blessed. Neither should a poor person feel bad because he hasn't climbed many rungs on the ladder of success. No, it was the people at the church who separated the two visitors, making one feel welcome and the other one feel unwelcome. The sin was the faulty judgment of God's people that they made and the motive that prompted them to make it. The church made a sinful value judgment about its two visitors based solely on outside criteria. In this case, their economic status. The act and their motives are both evil. Listen to God's word in verse 4. He said, Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Notice that phrase, among yourself. 
It's bad enough that the rich man was honored and the poor man discriminated against simply because of their economic class. But the sin was not limited to the one who led them to their respective seats. The sin belonged to everybody else in the church who saw what was happening and did nothing about it. That's one reason why the sin of partiality is so insidious. It spreads and infects too many people. In the mid-90s, I was pastoring a church in the western part of the state. And across the street from the church was a trailer park that was going through a demographical transition. The park was beginning to be occupied by black and Mexican families. Naturally, the children of this park be soon began to attend the church. Not long after the children started coming, so many of the parents started to attend. And not long after that, the devil used to, began to do his work among the white congregation of the church. After a few weeks of our people complaining quietly amongst themselves, they began to vocalize their complaints publicly. Soon it reached the point where I needed to say something from the pulpit. So I did. I remember that Sunday morning telling the entire congregation, white, black, and Hispanic, that our church was open to and would welcome anybody at all who wanted to come into the church for the purpose of worship. If anyone was there for any other reason, they needed to get up and go home. There were quite a few amens from our long-term members. But then I added this sentence. Now having said all that, a lot of you white folk need to get up and go home. At about the same time, my mother-in-law told me that one Sunday morning a couple had joined their church in Fayetteville. They, that, that fact that a couple joined created a, a certain level of excitement in the church because it had been a long time since anyone had joined the church. And it just so happened that on that Sunday night that, those, those two, that couple joined, several of the ladies were talking and the pastor was with them. And one of the ladies said, how I commented on how excited everybody was because that couple had joined the church. And my mother-in-law told me that the pastor said, well, those people are so poor they won't help the church any at all. The problem with prejudice, church, is not skin, it is sin. It's just, not just about social or economic problems or result of how you were raised. It's not culture, it's not color, it's not money. The Bible calls it a sin and it's still very real today. We need to call partiality what it is. The partiality of prejudice is not only sinful, it is also ignorant as well because it ignores four different things. The person who displays it is displaying a form of spiritual stupidity or dullness. Let me show you what I mean. Partiality, first of all, ignores spiritual reality. Look in verse 5 where James boldly writes, Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. One reason that partiality reveals spiritual ignorance is because it ignores the reality of what God is doing in the world. If you want to know what God is up to, you'll often find him hanging out with the poor, the outcasts, and those that are despised by this world. Now, I need to say up front and very clearly that there is nothing inherently spiritual about being part of a particular racial, economic, or ethnic class. Just being poor or outcast does not make you a saint. But the fact remains, God often chooses to do his work amongst the poor and the despised. God uses the poverty of the poor to give them a richness of faith that a lot of affluent people may never know. A lot of rich people in this world are too busy being rich and self-sufficient to even sense that they have spiritual poverty or they have a need for God. You remember when you were first starting out in life and had absolutely nothing? Chances are, when you had nothing, God had more of you. 
as we begin to measure people by their possessions or by their other physical or material criteria, our spiritual vision becomes blurred. The blurred vision breeds spiritual ignorance because the people the world values the least are highly valued by God. On His judgment day, we're going to find out that things are reversed and the true riches of the world of the people will be revealed. Jesus Himself said, the last will be first and the first will be last. At the judgment seat of God, poor folk and the nobodies of this world will be raised up to the top. But partiality also ignores the role of faith. Partiality often ignores and denigrates the great faith of people who are victims of mistreatment and discrimination. Believers who are so easily looked down upon by this world due to their lack of status or wealth are often very rich in their faith. Jesus taught us to pray every day for our daily bread. Most of us don't pray with much intensity because not only do we have today's bread in the house, we have tomorrow's and next week's and next month's food in our pantries and in our refrigerators and freezers. However, there are many people in this world and even in this country who get on their knees every day and say, Lord, if we're going to be fed today, you're going to have to supply our food. They're trusting God literally day by day. And in some places of this world, people are trusting God meal by meal. These people are rich in faith. And God says that makes them wealthy people. Since that's true, it is an act of spiritual ignorance to practice prejudice and partiality against the materially poor and our outcast people. Our, our prejudice, our ignorance tells them that they and their faith aren't worth, worth much in God's sight. But God says He's going to make them His heirs. People who are poor by the world standards will be great in the kingdom. Partiality also ignores God's priorities. You may be, have already figured out that God delights in reversing the world's idea of things. Paul spells this out very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 26, he says, Consider your calling, brethren, that there are not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not that he may nullify the things that are so that no man should boast before God. Now don't misunderstand God's not saying we should treat rich people badly in favor of the poor. That's reverse discrimination. You're not evil just because you're rich. And you're not godly just because you're poor. God's priority is what's on the inside of the person. But the sin of partiality causes us to ignore that priority. Since wealth, skin color, or ethnic origin, or anatomy say absolutely nothing about a person's real value, we ought not to judge and treat people on the basis of these external criteria. Partiality is just plain ignorant. And lastly, partially, partiality ignores spiritual warfare. A soldier who's supposed to be at war, yet can't identify the enemy, is in dangerous dangerous territory. He is dangerously ignorant. So are we as believers who practice prejudice. Scripture asks in the last half of verse 6, James, is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? That's generally how the world works, isn't it? You know the golden rule of the world he who has the gold gets to rule. 
Now, we can't generalize too much, but by and large, the story of mankind has largely been the oppression of the poor and the weak by the wealthy and the powerful. Today, it is mostly the rich and powerful who lobby for laws that go against our Christian faith and value. So it is in the spiritual realm. But the Bible is saying that if you favor the rich over the poor, if you favor the powerful over the weak, you may be favoring your oppressors. Church, let's don't give the devil another weapon to use against us. Third aspect I want you to see about partiality is the solution. This is the good news. The solution to the sin of partiality is conform conformity to the objective standard of God's Word. Remember in our study of Acts, even Peter, the once bigoted Jew, came to understand that God is not one to show partiality. Now again, let me emphasize, the problem is not that people are different. God designed us with differences. Whether the differences are in superficial things like music, clothing, or food choices, or whether they're in deeper things such as our racial and cultural backgrounds. Differences are legitimate. The problem is when we let those differences keep us from treating people justly and fairly. When we can't, or more accurately, when we won't relate to someone because they are a different color or a different sex or have a different size checkbook, you have the beginning of partiality. The only solution is a biblical one. And the Bible tells us we need to do three things. First of all, we need to obey the royal law. James says in verse 8, if, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. A more complete statement of what James calls a royal law, we found in Matthew 22, where Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love God with all that we have, with everything that we have, and to love our neighbors just as we love ourselves. Simply put, the royal law is the law of love. Now we know that the royal law has two dimensions. It has a vertical dimension which describes our, our love of God and His love for us. But it also has a horizontal dimension, our love for, for, for each other. The love of God and the love of neighbor are intimately related. The Bible doesn't mince words at all because the, gospel, the Apostle John wrote in 1 John, the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So the royal law demands that we love God with everything that is in us. But the Bible says we cannot love God no matter how much we say we do if we don't love one another. Now, this is not just talking about an emotional love or the feeling of love we have someone. When the Bible talks about love, it's talking about a decision of the will. That is why obeying God's royal law offers us the first step in solving the sin of partiality. If we love God with everything that we have, and if we love others just as we love ourselves, there is no room for partiality or prejudice. Love is not a feeling. Love is an action. Or as New Song said, love is not a noun. Love is a verb. So we obey the royal law. Secondly, James, and James is very direct on this point, simply call partiality what it really is. He says in verses 9 through 12, But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. 
Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murders, you, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. Church, we won't get anywhere in our growth toward being Christ-like until we label sin correctly. A person who shows prejudice against those of a different race is a racist. And racism is sin. A person who shows prejudice against those of a different sex is a sexist. And a sexism is sin. The same is true for any other kind of discrimination or prejudice. When we commit this sin, we are put in a category that God calls transgressors. Now it's starting to get a little heavy, isn't it? God says the prejudiced person is no different than a murderer or an adulterer or a thief. Now we're quick to protest. Prejudice is not the same thing as murdering someone. Well, God says it is. Look again at verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. My church, I need to confess to you. I am a murderer. I'm an adulterer. I'm a rapist. I'm a thief. I'm a drug dealer. But this verse says, if I'm guilty of one, I'm guilty of them all. There is no difference in the eyes of God. Now James goes on to explain that a murderer can't expect to get off by pleading his innocence on the charge of adultery. Can you imagine somebody standing before a judge and saying, Your Honor, I did in fact murder that man, but I never cheated on my wife because you've got to let me go. <laughs> not committing one sin does not cancel out the penalty for the one you did commit. The same God who, com who commanded us not to commit adultery, not to commit murder, also commanded us not to show partiality or prejudice toward other people. Partiality is sin, and all sin is serious. So we're to obey the royal law. We're to call partiality what it really is. And then the third step to solve this problem of partiality is to show mercy to all. This third aspect of, is found in a word of hope. Look at verse 13. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. When we show mercy to others, when we act with love and justice to all, regardless of race, culture, class, or sex, God turns that mercy around to our eternal credit. One day, as we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we'll all have to give an account for everything we did, for everything we failed to do, and the motivation behind each decision. Our heavenly rewards are based on this accounting. Now, I can't speak for you, but I know I haven't always done the right thing. And I know that sometimes I did the right thing for the wrong reason. But this verse tells me that God is going to recognize every time I showed mercy to someone else. Every time I made the world's nobody feel like God's somebody. Every time I treated someone that was different from me according to God's royal law. God will acknowledge that mercy and show me mercy. Remember what it says. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Always. So what does the solution to partiality look like when you put it all together? It begins by naming and confessing partiality as sin. It includes a commitment to obey the royal law of love. And it means looking for opportunities to act with justice and mercy to everyone. If we are growing in Christ's likeness and following in His footsteps toward the goal of perfection, the sin of partiality 
will never again be a problem for us. That is what it means for us to say we are one in the bond of love. We are one family. Regardless of where we came from, regardless of our background, regardless of what church we go to, what denomination we may attend, we're all one family. And I am glad to be a part of the family of God with each and every one of you. Father God, we say thank you for the mercy you have shown to us, for the way in which you came to us and honored us, esteemed us, redeemed us. And even though we have absolutely, we can offer no value to you in and of ourselves, we know you have put value in us. And you have loved us. And you have said you want us to be with you forever and ever and ever. And what you've done for each one of us, you made possible for every man, every woman, every human. So God, let us not sin against you by treating people differently, no matter the reason why. Instead, without compromising holiness and righteousness which you have given us, and without participating in sin with them, let us go to the sinful and the outcast and show them but someone showed us about your great love. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for adopting all of us into your family so that we together as brothers and sisters and call you our Father. May we always bring honor to your name. And may we never, ever cause you to be ashamed to be our God and to be our Father. But this is our prayer in your name.